This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Levijou. Welcome to episode 32 of the podcast. Sorry it's been a bit of a gap since our last one. Actually, we had recorded this particular episode several weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, there were some technical issues that prevented us from using that material, so we've had to go back and do it again. And, of course, this is the time of year where it can be pretty tricky to get things scheduled. And Mark's in the middle of his season, and he's got added duties now that he's taken over the Australian national team. And even though it might sound like it should be a relatively easy time for a college coach. Spring is definitely not. In a lot of ways, it's trickier um, on the on the calendar than it is in the fall. In any case, you know, throw in a seven hour time difference, and you, you know, you have some struggles trying to coordinate things. In any case, this uh, particular episode is based on a comment from the Glenn Hogue interview, in which he he shares a bit of insight from. Legendary coach Julio Velasco. Um, it has to do with the the coach's mentality and how it needs to be separated from a player's mentality. And I think this is something that's that's particularly relevant for those of you who may either still be players on some level, or who perhaps have just shifted into coaching after a playing career. So you're still kind of in that early stages. And even for more experienced coaches, you know, there might be elements of it that you could perhaps use a refresher on or you, know, or you just want to listen to Mark and I ramble on about subjects. In any case, I um, hope you enjoy it. All right, so in your interview with Glenn Hogue, he brought up the idea from Julio Velasco that when you become a coach, you have to kill the player inside you. Um, which I found really interesting. And I, I know I've talked with other people on the subject um, since that interview. Yep. The, the, and I remember when I was a young coach, then I was still a player, maybe not all the time physically, but certainly mentally I was still there. And the anxiousness that you feel on the sideline and the, and the, and the need to almost play the game with the players. You're, you're making their reactions, yep. you're making the moves. And I even saw a video, I think this was on YouTube, of a coach. I don't know what league, what level, whatever, but he was literally diving on the sideline with his team trying to make defensive plays or cover yeah, plays or whatever a, it was, which is a little bit crazy. It's um, a famous Brazilian coach. Oh, is it a Brazilian? Okay. Yeah. That yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily him still being a player or just being really, really enthusiastic. Um, and his support with his team. Either way, it seems like... I have a, I have a third option. Up. Okay. Yeah, it's not really a good one for publication. Though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll let, we'll let that one slide. Um, I mean, it sounded to me like uh, like Velasco's point is is goes beyond the the idea of, of that kind of that reaction of of being a player and, and kind of playing the points with your team and strikes more into the mentality that you have to have as a coach, as a teacher, as a leader, which is different than a player's mentality. Does that sound about right? Well, we only have our interpretations to go, go yeah, on anyway, but actually. I I think the way I interpret it is, is exactly that. And the player's mindset is uh, is and has to be an essentially selfish one. Players are thinking about their position in the team. Players are thinking about the, what they have to do to be personally ready for each match or each tournament, be it nutritionally, uh, health-wise, training, treatment. And so the main focus, even players in a leadership character, uh, capacity in the team, their main focus is, is nearly always on them. So uh, that, I think, is the biggest part of the player that a coach has to kill because as soon as you become a coach, everything is different from that point of view. You have to consider 
uh, firstly, a program, a team has a large number of issues that players never have to think about, be it um, relationships with management, be it coordinating staff, be it uh, coping with the press or fans. The job is a much bigger and broader job than the the job of a a player ever is. Uh, That's the first part. The second one is that the coach is required to consider what's best for everybody inside the team. And sometimes what's best for the team is not what's best for some individual players, uh, which is which is difficult, uh, difficult to manage, um, different difficult mentality to to arrive at. And the the whole role then then is different. And if you start to think as a coach, if you continue to be selfish and do things for your benefit, um, that mentality doesn't serve you nearly as well, certainly doesn't serve the team, as uh, that mentality serves the uh, player. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, my first impression when you when you talk about kind of the selfish side of things is we still see selfish coaches. We still see coaches who they they – relate their teams and this is ego to a degree and maybe a lack of, uh, of confidence in other degrees but they they link the team's performance to their own whatever um, yeah. sense of self um, sense of worth you name it and we and we all do this to a greater or lesser degree you know, and with a lot of aspects in our life and, and particularly with jobs you know um, I think maybe men more than women but uh, you know let's not get down that path. Uh, but there is a, there is a tendency to equate yourself to what you do. I am a volleyball coach. I am a manager of a corporation. I am whatever, whatever. Um, you know, and you, you can get into the philosophical debate about whether that's whether you are what you do or or something else. But the the implication is that as a coach, coaches can be selfish in ways that relate to that for better and for worse. I mean, sometimes you do need to be selfish in certain regards, um, but the coach, just as much as they need to be taking the perspective of I'm doing things for the good of the whole team, not just for the player, also needs to be thinking of I'm doing the things for the good of the whole you know, unit, um, whether it's the team, whether it's the club, whether, you know, in, in the case of a, a university coach, the, the, the athletic department, and these things may not be necessarily what's for your best. And yes. You know, you always get that conflict, um, you know, an economist would get into incentives and, you know, why this and why that. And, and there's, there's career implications here, you know, what's going to be best for me in the long run, for my next job, or, you know, for me getting a raise. And, and we've talked certainly on plenty of occasions about, Hey, you know, if you're a coach who's being employed by somebody, then you need to be appearing to do all the stuff that coaches are supposed to appear to do, taking timeouts and and otherwise making interventions. <laughs> and, and you're chuckling, so I know <laughs> I know you know where I'm going with that. Uh, that's that's one of that's one side of things that coaches are supposed to do. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, you can you can continue to go down that path and. And uh, talk about drills. You're supposed to do drills. You're supposed to do a bunch of other things, and your that um, may or may not actually be correct. Right. And a couple of things that came up when you were talking earlier was, I remember in the early days of my coaching, after I had gotten beyond, I think the former player stage, where. I remember my vision, and it was almost like a physical feeling of my vision expanding as I was yep. coaching. And then you take in more and more, and, and, and obviously you're training yourself to do this to a certain degree. Because you know when you're first coaching or when you're as a player, you see that the final play, somebody shanked the ball or somebody hit the ball out of bounds or, or whatever, and you're automatically trying to draw conclusions based on that thing when in reality, it was the result of 
putting you know maybe three steps prior, and you don't see that when you're very individually focused or very narrowly focused. Um, it's something that comes with with practice and, and training and development. And the other yeah. thing was uh, something that came up in uh, one of the episodes, one of the recent episodes of The Net Live, where they were talking with Kevin Hamby about his, you know, when he took over at Stanford, and he described, you know, as a as a college coach, he said, I think he said, seven percent of his time is actually spent coaching volleyball on the court, practice matches, whatever. The rest of it is administration yeah. and all the things that go around it that a lot of people don't think of. I mean, you brought up some of the stuff, and that's one of those bridge points between being a player and a coach. Players don't see that stuff. I mean, yes, they, they are no, involved I, in some of it, but they don't see a lot of the stuff that leads up to the stuff that they're involved in. And they they don't see it, and it's very often not something they consider in the terms of uh, actual coaching work. So uh, they they think of coaching as being that period during practice or that period during the match, and they're not ready for uh, for any more more. And it was a I remember an anecdote. Uh, uh, Ruben, a friend of the program, so to speak, who yeah. uh, who met Gianni, the famous uh, Italian player, early in Gianni's coaching career. So he's a he's a few years in now, and he's uh, been pretty successful in what he's doing. But but Ruben relates the story of meeting in this uh, small preseason tournament and and uh, having a chat as Ruben does and. At some moment, uh, Johnny putting his arm around Ruben and just saying, "Coaching is really hard," <laughs> and uh, I always, uh, I always think of that just that line. And this is a guy who had traversed all of the peaks of playing, championships, international medals, world championships, record caps holder for. Um, you know, for an Italian team, 500 internationals or whatever ridiculous number it ended up being, et cetera, et cetera. And he was, seemed at least, to have been completely unprepared for um, that, whatever that extra thing is as a coach, that, that uh, yeah, that 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week thing that players just don't have. Yeah, I mean, as a player, you know, the worst thing that's that's happening to you is, you know, you're replaying that that mistake that you made that you think, you know, cost you the match. Or on the flip side, you're goring in the play that you made that you think won the won your team the match, uh, depending on how yeah. the results fall out. Whereas with the coach, I mean, if you're doing your job right, and actually you, you brought up mention, I just, uh, Ruben, I was just talking with him yesterday on the subject yeah. of constant reflection. And you're, you're, uh, yes. if, if you're truly trying to get better all the time, win or lose, you're always thinking about how do I get better? How do we get better? You know, what's, what do I have to do next? What corrections do I need to make to get the most out of this group and to become a better coach and to help that player and, you know, and expand how, what we can do in this situation and, and all these, you know, and, and off the court, you know, all the stuff that you have to do off the court. Whether it's player assessment or mm-hmm. recruiting and, and dealing with the management and dealing with the press and anybody else that's a, you know involved in your your team and your program, um, like you say, it's it. Those are the things. All that stuff, you know, keeps coaches awake at night. Not just what happened on the court. Yes, I can verify that statement has been correct. <laughs> If, uh, if if we go back to the uh, to the original um, to the original line there about killing the killing the player, I I might want to disagree ever so slightly with the with the statement that I think that you should uh, uh, certainly get control of the player within. 
but I think there are a couple of areas where it's uh, where it's really useful to um, uh, to keep the the player in mind and and one thing that that really I think is really important is uh, is considering how your decisions impact players and it's really easy to get into the rhythm for want of a better word of uh of making decisions and uh and doing the thing that's best doing the things that are best for the team but i think it's an important uh skill if the if the coach can maintain a little contact with the the player inside as to how those decisions might affect uh might affect the the players and it can be simple things like um, like when to program training, for example. So uh, there are certainly a lot of things, a lot of uh, theoretical constructs about when and how is the best time to practice. Um, but those theoretical constructs aren't always uh, well taken by the players. Um, and they're actually less, a lot less useful in practice. And um, there are things like that, you know, some stuff like meal time, some stuff like, you know, organising meetings when you're on the road, the t- when you do those sort of things. And um, the coach is gets into the habit, and maybe this is a description I needed to, to use before, but the coach gets into the habit of it being 24-7 for him and forgets sometimes that it's not 24-7 for everybody else and there are actually better times, uh, better better structures to use than the ones that are just easiest for him. <laughs> Very true. Very true. I've seen plenty of coaches who do what they think and is great for them. Maybe but- one other area where it's not, where you do need to kill the, kill the player inside is, uh, is during the match, whereas the player where the player um, has uh, control over the outcome uh, and is used to being able to exert that control. Um, coaches, despite conventional wisdom, don't really have a lot of outcome once the game, uh, sorry, control over, over the outcome once the game has started. So uh, the quicker you can divest yourself of that baggage, as a coach and making the transition from player to coach, I think the, the better you, you can be as a coach. Uh, what you brought up in terms of the, the player mentality and, 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 and plans and, and when and structuring things, maybe think about just the relationship between the coach and player, which is, which obviously is going to be different than a player to player relationship. Um, and, and brings up the, the question of generations and, and how, an older coach deals with younger players and, and how that stuff evolves over time because we see situations where uh, an older coach essentially loses a team because he just he struggles to relate to them on their level anymore. Um, this is a question of Arsene Wenger at Arsenal right now uh, with, his, with his group yeah. and, and their performance. And, and you see it in other sports, and, and you have to argue that the, the, the really top coaches who are, are successful over a long, long period of time either are able to do it themselves or are able to bring in good staff members to help them do it. And, you know, younger assistant coaches who are maybe more relatable to to those players or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, it, and there's that whole question of, you know, you, you've tweeted about this stuff and you've posted about this stuff about, Coaches who blame th- this generation, or this generation of players, yada yada yada, <laughs> <laughs> for, for yes. shortcomings on on the court or on the field, and you know, and, mm-hmm. and you laugh at that, and, and I always, I may not laugh out loud at it, but whenever I see it, I'm going, well, that coach, I I, I would love to coach against that coach because I'm going to beat you because I'm I, I know that my relationship has to be with those players as those players are, not some fantasy construct that you have of what players should be and that's again goes back to dropping the player mentality you know you, you can't project and we, we've we've talked about this before you can't project 
what a player should be onto your players, especially what you were as a player. And you see this with a lot of young coaches. I played like Uh, this. I had this level of intensity. I had this mentality. Most other players aren't like you. That you know, that's just the reality of of life. I I think that that's a fantastic that's a fantastic point that all coaches I am all all coaches who were players go through that the players aren't like they were. Now, partly that's because every generation is different anyway. So it's uh, our coaches. I'm almost certain said exactly the same things about my generation of players as my generation is saying about the co- the players that they had now, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. There's the there's the meme that finds its that you know wanders out every uh, every so often with um, a quote from Aristotle or Socrates or oh, a Greek Socrates. philosopher, yeah, yeah about. The, how terrible the current generation is. So, it's uh, firstly you have to recognise that it's just standard that every gener- every generation thinks the next one is a bunch of idiots. And this is pure speculation on my part, but I think the type of people who become coaches are mostly different anyway. Uh, I think that. And I, this could just be a completely self-serving argument, of course, but um, I think that coaches are, are the, or the people who become coaches are driven in a different way than most most player, people, most people, and definitely most players. And it was a big adjustment that I I had to uh, to deal with was the uh, particularly the idea of competition that um, I expected every person that I coached to be as as competitive as me. And it took me some small time to understand that um, actually in life, hardly anybody is as competitive as me. And that's you know why people do things that they do and why I do things that I do. And you have to be able to separate those, uh, those two things because if you... Expect people to be like you, be it competitiveness or any other thing, then you are doomed to a life of extreme disappointment. Right. Well, and, and this relates to the idea of, of great players becoming coaches um, and, yes. and struggling to, to deal with the fact that everybody else is not as good as you are. So you can't just tell them, well, go do it, because that's, that's not going to be useful for anybody. I, I worked with uh, an assistant coach a while back, <clears throat> excuse me, who <clears throat> was an All-American as a player. Yep. And you know, she would get frustrated when the players that we were coaching at the time wouldn't you know, execute to the skill that she expected, which was basically mm-hmm. the level of skill that she had as a player. And I yep. remember her in practice one day just saying, you know, we're doing some service option or something like that, and and she's just just pass the ball. <laughs> like, well, that doesn't help them. They're trying to just pass the ball. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I don't believe she's she's still in coaching anymore, which is probably not a, a big surprise. Uh, but that's that's one of the struggles. And, and you know, certain players get that when and realize that in their in their mentality is they try to shift from playing to coaching. And so, you know, maybe they go somewhere else. Like Larry Bird coached for a few years, but realized he was not the technical coach. And so he left that to be somebody else. And then eventually he said, you know what? I'm probably better off being a general manager. Uh, yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty good example. And despite all the things that we've just talked about, I, I do wonder, though, whether it's actually true that great players don't make good coaches and why I, why I say that is there's certainly anecdotal examples of, uh, of both directions of, uh, of average players who become great coaches and great coaches who fall, great players who fall by the wayside as coaches but I often wonder 
whether it's just a, a, a bias that we have or a, a misunderstanding of, uh, of statistics that there are, to begin with, very few great players by definition. Right. Very few of those become coaches at all, try to become coaches at all, and you know, only one or two or a very, very small sample of those become great coaches. So, you know, the, the fact that it's only three or four is coming from a small group to begin with. And if you want to look at, there's a lot more average co- players in the world or players who never achieved anything. There's a whole bunch of those who try to become coaches and there's very few of them who become great coaches. And I wonder if the proportion of the two groups who become great coaches is actually any different from it, from the other. Right. Yeah, coaching is a, is a different skill set than playing. So uh, that you know, too, yeah. It's a you know it's a leadership education type skill set. So mm-hmm. you know, does the, the the small number of elite players who are coaches simply reflect the fact that only a small number of people have that particular skill set to become an elite coach? Yeah, that's it's a it's a fair uh, question. Yeah, you know? yeah, and the the number of elite players is pretty small too. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the, you want to talk about football or, or uh, NBA or something, there's, a, there's a, not many players in the NBA and there's hardly any of those who are great players. So, you know. Yeah. And great players in every sport have actually more opportunities to do other things. <laughs> True, like going to broadcasting. As, <laughs> as, as Johnny said, coaching is really hard. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's the other side of it is coaching is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. You can just go do TV and you know work a couple hours a day. <laughs> uh, although, yeah, you can do that. I'm. It's less broadcasting is less mentally consuming than uh, coaching. I'm I'm fairly confident of that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you got to do your prep work and, and whatnot, but yeah, yeah. Plus, they have if they've managed themselves properly, they have enough money to be flexible in whatever they do. Um, you know, it's not a pressure of a, of a salary. Certainly, yeah. at our level, coaching is not going to make anybody rich. Not in our sport. In other sports, perhaps, but not in our sport. Not currently. No, I, I think even the. Uh even the really good coaches, even the top coaches in volleyball um, never have the situation where they don't have to work. Right. Yeah, so, I, I can't think of... I mean, I know some of the coach, some of the top college coaches in the U.S. are making multiple six figures. But, yeah, that, they only get that for as long as, as they keep coaching unless they develop exactly. some sort of bi- a side business that is able to carry on, you know, but even then, how much is that bringing in versus what their salary would be? I, I you know, I can't answer that question. Yeah. You know, you're still going out. And I mean, most of these coaches, their, their extra income is doing camps and doing clinics and you still have to go work. You know, it's not like you could just sit back and let the money flow in generally. I know, I know I have to work. This is John. Do you have to work? Yes, sadly, every go. day. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. All right, we're we're running up on on our time. Uh, any final thoughts? I I really like the quote. I think that it really neatly encapsulates the differences between, or at least the idea that coaching and playing are, are two different activities. And while they have some core similarities, they're, they're much different and that a, that a player who becoming a coach needs to make that, that change in his own head before anywhere else. So I, as, uh, as often happens in, in uh, these, these interviews, there are just, just little bits of wisdom. There you go. Hashtag wizard wisdom. <laughs> Hashtag wizard wisdom, yes. 
All right. We'll finish it there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.